Warning! Spoilers ahead! Oh! 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 Nearly there now, my love. Just a little ways longer. This sickness will be the end of me. It's unnatural. This carriage is worsening your state. I'm sure some rest will do you wonders. Driver! Slow the horses! We will find a cure. Velen, a no man's land where crime is rife, and most care not a whit for their neighbor's fate. Where a cruel baron is king and his knaves are free to rape, pillage and murder to their heart's desire. In this land, this fetid pool of human filth, lies Crookback Bog. The swamp may look unassuming at first, but do not let it fool you. At the very edge of these marshlands stands a wooden effigy, adorned with seemingly scrumptious treats. Yet, were one to eat such a pastry, instead of a baker's delight, they might feel maggots wriggling on their tongue. Because these swamps are home to the ladies of the woods, better known to most as the crones. Revered by the nearby village of Down Warren, Loathed and feared by most others, their powers both mysterious and frightening, they draw from the lands and the people they rule. Once per year, they hold a grand Sabbath on Ard Kerbin, Bald Mountain, where three lucky youth are sent up the mountain to meet the ladies face to face. Lucky indeed, for they would never return. Only the chosen visit the ladies. Every year, young lads and lasses climb the mount but never more than three. Let me guess, the young lads and lasses don't return. No, they return happy and radiant. But rare is the one who then stays in Valen. Off they go to seek fortune in the wider world. The youths would be eaten, and their blood fed to the crones and the monstrous tree that fuels their power further. The ladies would take on the form of the slain men and women, and ascend the mountain in their radiant shapes. Of course, they wouldn't ever stay, as said. They'd leave for greener pastures. The dead cannot remain in the land of the living. In return for these sacrifices, the villagers of Down Warren would receive acorns, sometimes few, sometimes many. Acorns that held great power to heal wounds, grant fertility to the ground, and many other boons. A life for a life. Did that justify their cruelty? Their lies? Perhaps the villagers thought it so, but Geralt was not so easily swayed. When he first met these creatures in his quest to find Ciri, it was through another unfortunate's fate. The Bloody Baron, and with him, his family. His wife, Anna, in an effort to get away from the Baron for good, beseeched the crones to remove the child she was to bear him, so that she and her daughter Tamara could run away together to start a new life elsewhere. The crones agreed to help, but in exchange, Anna would return to Crookback Bog to serve the ladies for a full year. What Anna did not realize, however, was that the crones' help never came in ways one might hope. In the case of Anna, they weakened her so gravely that she eventually miscarried. The same night, on the run from home, a fiend leapt from the woods to drag Anna from her horse and into the swamps, where she would serve out her sentence in service to the crones. And depending on Geralt's choices, her fate would change drastically, though terrible it would remain. But the Baron and Anna are not the crones' only victims. No, their greatest source of fresh blood seems to come from a small village by the name of Down Warren. There, all villagers are bound to the crones from the time of their first cutting. The cutting, in this case, being the moment a youngling's hair is cut and their hair presented to the crones to weave into their grand tapestry of fate. From then on, the child's life is in their hands. However, hair is not the only thing offered to the ladies in this way. No, far more lucrative an offering is a child in its entirety. How did you wind up here? My father brought me, told me to follow the trail of treats and eat my fill. He said he would wait. So I started down the trail, but then I saw a butterfly, and I ran to catch it, and I lost my way. 
Your father, why did he have you follow the trail of treats? Do you know? Because we had nap to break our fast with. I don't understand. I was naughty. Broke a jug. Spilled all our milk. Your parents must have been angry. Mother said I should be spanked, but father said wouldn't do no good. Too many mouths to feed anyway. Sending me down the trail of treats, that would solve things. Do parents often send their children out to follow the sweets? Sometimes they send their children, sometimes they go themselves. In the book, The Ladies of the Wood, we receive from Kira Metz, we read the following. This is how one begs help from the ladies. Find a child, young and innocent, and take it to Crookback Bog. Search out the Lady Shrine, that is where the trail of treats begins. Set the child off on the trail, and it shall follow its sweet track and find the good ladies. The child will never want for anything ever again, for the ladies are kind and generous. Standing before their shrine, pronounce your request, and the good ladies will hear, for they see and hear all that takes place in their demesne. If you made the offering as it must be done, your supplication will be heard. Gretka, after she was naughty, was sent to follow the Trail of Treats. The Trail of Treats is the path that leads to the home of the crones, at least in the physical realm. Once there, the book says the child would want for nothing. They would eat their fill and live a blessed life among the ladies. We know this isn't so, of course. When Geralt inspects the treats on the trail more closely, they crumble into maggots in his hands. And once the child did reach the crone's orphanage in the middle of the swamp, they would indeed be able to eat their fill. But once they were nice and plump, they'd be taken by the ladies and tossed into a human stew. The parents, it was said, would be allowed to make a supplication, though whether any wish is truthfully granted isn't known. And not only the people of Down Warren took part in this ritual, Gretka herself was not from Down Warren either. The poor parents must simply not be aware of what truly happens to their children. Or are they? Well, it's interesting how Gretka notes that sometimes they send their children, sometimes they go themselves. But we don't see any adults other than Anna at the orphanage. We don't see any mention of adults in the book. So going themselves must be an act of desperation. If the adults truly thought that going down the trail of treats would solve all their worries, why wouldn't they all go? Why don't entire villages walk down the path together en masse? Why, if the ladies are truly so good to all, does the Alderman seem unwilling to talk about them until Geralt shows their allegiance first? Well, likely, because in truth, they do know what happens to their children. Gretka was naughty, and they sent her off down the trail. Her father said he was waiting for her, but it likely wasn't to take her back, but instead to make sure she'd walk down the whole way. They had too many mouths to feed. A sacrifice had to be made. Children don't return from their walk in the woods. As cruel as this sounds, and it truly is, in the grand scheme of things, it's almost difficult to blame the villagers for doing such things. As Gretka said, they had naught to break their fast with, even if, in their hearts, the parents knew it would be the end of Gretka, what would they do otherwise? With nothing to eat, Gretka would likely die of hunger or disease eventually. If not Gretka, another in the family might. Instead, they chose to sacrifice their daughter, so the rest might live, and the crones who ground them magical acorns could be appeased. The Elderman of Down Warren notes that the ladies are harsh mistresses, but they're fair, just. Demanding they can be, but then nothing in life comes easy. The villagers are forced to cut off their ears as an offering to the crones. These are the statues they pray to. The villagers know there is very little reason to believe that they don't. Velen is plagued by famine and disease, highway robberies and murders. Who can truly blame the villagers for turning to a higher power, one that has proven to be effective? One that demands child sacrifices, surely. But the Baron's men leave them be. The Baron's men, who are seen in other villages less pious to the ladies, to rape, murder, steal, and pillage. Down Warren is untouched, well-fed, and, for the most part, 
happy. The crones act as the true sovereigns of Velen, whose inhabitants they help survive through harsh times in return for unquestioning obedience. They wield powerful magic, but one different from that of mages. They draw power from water and earth and are bound to the land in which they live. The crones can hear everything that happens in their woods, predict the future, twist the threads of human lives, and bring blessings as well as curses. They seem, for all intents and purposes, to be immortal. Magic elixirs keep them from aging and allow them to take the appearance of young women. These elixirs and their mystical ties to the swamps in which they live also give them supernatural strength and vitality. And yet they demand child sacrifices to stay in their good graces. Why? Well, if we believe the Bruess, simply because they taste good, which is not a very good reason. But the crones were not always alone, and perhaps they were not always so cruel long, long ago. And why not? By Melitel, why not? Surely there must be something you can do! My deepest apologies, my lord, but her illness is not known to our priestesses. Her life is in the Mother Goddess's hands now. Ludicrous! Charlatans, all of you! They were at a loss also, then. Your face speaks volumes, my love. Incompetent dogs, the lot of them. There must be someone else. Do not torture yourself so. I have consigned myself to my fate. I will fight for our child, but it will be the last of my battles. No! No! There must be something we can do. I have heard of a pagan cult in the woods in the province of Velen. They are said to be... resourceful. The ladies of the woods? My love, you mustn't. I too have heard of their legend, but they will not aid you lest a sacrifice is made. Very well. Very well. I will continue my search. Very little is known about the crones as creatures go, save their names. From oldest to youngest, we first have Wispus, who cuts the ears of those who serve them. These ears now adorn the trees and statues found around the bog. Through them, the crones hear all that goes on in their domain, and likely all their previous owners hear outside of it as well. Bruess, one who crafts the broth drawn from human flesh. In many stories, it is said that to eat another person's flesh bestows upon them the power they had in life. Their energy, spiritual or otherwise, would flow into the cannibal and strengthen them through it. The crones are likely no different, as they attempt to eat Ciri, or at least parts of her, specifically for her elder blood as well. Perhaps the reason they eat children is simply because their spirit is still pure and unburdened, and thus more powerful. And finally, we Vess, who would receive hair from each villager born in Down Warren to weave into her magical tapestries. Not only that, but as in many real-world magic, hair holds great power over an individual. In the crone's case, they can weave hair into their version of voodoo dolls, thus allowing them to cast powerful curses should the villagers displease them in some way. The three sisters take inspiration from a great many real-world tales, most notably, of course, Baba Yaga, an old crone from Slavic mythology who lives deep in the forest in an ever-rotating house balancing precariously on chicken legs. And even though in most tales she seems to be represented as a single entity, she is sometimes written as a trio of sisters instead. She's not necessarily an evil witch, but decides on a case-per-case -case basis whether she wants to aid or harm. And as with the ladies of the woods, her help always comes at a price. Another obvious influence would seem to be the ancient fates, or Moirai, the three embodiments of destiny itself. They appear in many guises in many different cultures, but the most well-known one would be those from ancient Greece. There were always three, and each had their own designated task. Clotho, who spins the threads of fate. Her we can most easily link to Ives. Lachesis, one who determines one's lot in life. 
how long Clotho would spin their thread for any mortal, she could be equated to Brues, who meets out the portions in the most literal sense of the word. And finally, Atropos. Just as Wispes, she is the oldest of the sisters, and she represents death or the inevitable. She chose the manner of a mortal's demise and cut their thread when their time had come. Wispes, in turn, cuts the ears of those who serve her in a similar manner. She is also the one who burns Anna Strenger's mark when she is too slow to bring them the ear on the altar, and seems to be something of a leader in that regard. Obviously, they're not human. However, as they're categorized under relics, the question of what they could otherwise be is quite a broad one. The definition of a relict is a surviving species of an otherwise extinct group of organisms. Geralt doesn't recognize them either. And the only other link we have outside of Velen is the curious Lamen in the Professor's house found in Oxenfurt. Yes, the Lamen. Initially, I had thought it connected to Odim when I brought this up in his respective video series. However, it wasn't Odim's sigil on the Lamen at all, was it? It was the Crones. To refresh our memories, a Lamen is a magical pendant generally used to command authority and magic. The item would show the sigil of the spirit one wished to command as a sort of coat of arms. They were also used to invoke spirits of the Key of Solomon, powerful demons of hell. So in this sense, it's likely accurate to refer to the crones as demons. In the professor's case, he may have attempted to use the crones to defeat Gontaro Dim, or indeed, to find out more about him to begin with. However, the initial three crones we meet are not one of a kind. There is, in fact, a fourth. Yes, a fourth crone. Their sister, or perhaps their mother. We know her only as the Whispering Hillock, the Spirit, or she who knows, and very little else is known about her as a whole. And the knight who rode to the summit, who were he? Ogan no. Perhaps the ladies charmed him to serve them at the feast. Perhaps he were the one buried midst the oak's roots. One come to life when the tree bore acorns aplenty. And the fourth, who were she? Some say she were their mother. Others call her sister four. They took cold iron nails, pierced her heart, pierced her head, then sunk her lifeless corpse into a festering mire. A book can be found within the Witcher world titled She Who Knows as well, and it tells the story thusly, that the crones once had a mother, the true lady of the wood, who came from a faraway land, and as she was lonely, created three daughters out of dirt and water. She ruled alone, and all was well, but as time passed, she sunk into madness, madness that eventually spread across her domain. The daughters saw their land nearing destruction, and decided to save it by killing their mother and burying her in the bog. Her blood watered the oak atop Art Kerbin, and from then on, the tree grew wholesome and hearty fruit for the people. As the mother's soul refused to leave the land, the crones trapped it beneath the whispering hillock instead, where it still lay to this day. It is important to realize that this book was written by one loyal to the crones, without any doubt. This is what's known as an unreliable narrator. The crones told them a story, and the story was written as if it was entirely true. But is it? Art Kerbin, Bald Mountain. It does not look like the oak that grows there is in fact wholesome, and the crones can be caught in many a lie throughout our conversations with them regardless. When you opt to save the spirit in the Whispering Hillock, instead of destroying it, they tell you the children are in grave danger. That is a lie. Once freed, the spirit sets out to save the children from Crookback Bog, taking them from that horrible place and to the orphanage in Novigrad instead. It even seems they might have had their memories erased, as they don't seem to react to Geralt much. Whereas if you slay the spirit, the crones will eat the children. Which of these can be called grave danger? When you leave your conversation with the sisters, after dealing with the spirit either way, they will tell you this. You'll return, you shall. Our fates are bound, and one will die, but it shan't be one of us. And after that, and if you find her, if, the girl will die. 
Both are either a lie, or their prophecies are entirely dreadful. Geralt and Ciri do return, and two crones die. Neither Geralt nor Ciri do. Geralt did, in fact, also find Ciri, and she was not quite dead. She could even go for a walk. A word once given is false also. They promised Anna Strenger that they would remove her baby in return for a year of her service, and then she'd be freed. However, when she displeased them, she was turned into a beast, and if you allow the spirit to free the children, she is cursed doubly so. They make it impossible to fully lift the curse, even though it was not at all Anna's fault the children got away. The crones even admit to this. A word once given, but they fully intend to bend the truth to such an extent that the outcome favors them. Unsurprisingly, of course. So no, the crones are not at all trustworthy. But is the Whispering Hillock? She talks of the Druid Circle she's from, but Geralt notes that he's never heard of a Druid Circle of Velen. The Circle existing, however, is not a lie. It's simply too long ago for Geralt to know about. Thankfully, Avalach comes to our rescue here. Centuries ago, it was a hallowed site for Druids. But then the Crones arrived, destroyed the Velen Circle, and deformed the Sacred Oak atop the mountain. An important feast is observed here annually. The Sabbath, they call it. All the local folk attend. I suspect Imlareth attends too, as the Crone's guest. So, not only does this confirm that yes, there was in fact a druidic circle in Velen, it also confirms that the Crones were the ones to destroy it and deform the oak. This directly contradicts what is written in She Who Knows, where it is stated that the oak flourished after the spirit's defeat. Avalach has no reason whatsoever to lie about this odd fact in the crone's history. It gains him nothing. Ciri does not want the crones dead any more than she already does to avenge a group of druids she's never heard of before. She doesn't care why the crones are evil, just that they are. Nor does Avalach stand to gain anything from their demise at this point in time. So this particular small part of information is very important. However, it does not confirm that the spirit is, in fact, from this circle, merely that it existed. Although, it would be mighty odd to attempt to sway Geralt with a fact she should know he wouldn't be able to recall. The Whispering Hillock also speaks of standing in the way of the crones. I don't doubt that she did, but it doesn't necessarily confirm that the spirit was good, merely that she was an obstacle in the crones' pursuit of total domination in Velen. This could be either because, yes, she was a force of good, but also that she was simply another evil power vying for control. Finally, when Geralt mentions saving the children himself, the spirit states that there are no roads to Art Kevin. This is simply a complete lie. If it wasn't for invisible walls telling us not to go there yet because it isn't quite that time, Geralt could easily walk to Art Kerbin from the Whispering Hillock itself. It really isn't that far away, in all honesty. The spirit is merely trying to leverage the children against Geralt, so he's more easily swayed to save her. Furthermore, when we do eventually decide to aid the spirit, we are forced to find her bones, of course. Upon finding them, Geralt remarks that they don't seem human. Her bones don't seem human. But that's the extent of Geralt's findings. If the bones seemed elven or dwarven, or really any other living being Geralt had heard of before, he would have likely remarked on that instead of sounding so puzzled, which means that the bones are of a creature never before encountered by him, one much like the crones. I somehow doubt that a druidic circle would be inclined to include evil spirits, such as the ladies, to join the ranks. However, again, this doesn't prove anything conclusive, as there are many good spirits to be found in the Witcher world as well, and the spirit may well have been one of them. So, what then? Both parties are full of lies, both parties seem capable of destruction, evil. During the bad ending of The Witcher 3, it seems the swamp has been poisoned with the death of the two crones. So did the crones balance their evil with enough good? Is there a right choice? Well, that depends on how one sees the spirit, and I believe I can give her yet another name. Perhaps I am a fool for trying. 
But no. We have run out of options. This is the only way. Ladies lovely, with power all, I beseech thee, answer my call. Before you, a worm crawls, wretched and small. How dare you disturb our rest. Please, I come to you in my hour of need to ask a boon of thee. My wife is with child and has fallen gravely ill. No one can find the cause of her sickness and she is not long for this world. I beg thee, will you not cure her? Any riches and lands will be yours as you please. I sense your pain. I see your fear. A boon. A potion to cure my wife. Thank you. Thank you! I, I will await your demand for payment! The bestiary entry to the crones reads thusly. Sister crones, hand in hand, terrors of the sea and land, thus do go about, about, thrice to nine and thrice to mine, and thrice again to make up nine. This is a direct quote from one of Shakespeare's famous plays, Macbeth, specifically Act 1, Scene 3. In this scene, the crones make ready to sow some discord in the realm, much like the crones of Crookback Bog often seem to do. However, more important is their relation to a fourth figure. She is equally powerful, nay, far more so than the crones. In a later act, we meet her in person and hear her name. Why, how now, Hecate? You look angrily. Have I not reason, Beldams as you are, saucy and overbold? How did you dare to trade and traffic with Macbeth in riddles and affairs of death? And I, the mistress of your charms, the close contriver of all harms, was never called to bear my part or show the glory of our art. Hecate, one who calls herself the source of the witch's power in the play of Macbeth. Macbeth, which is directly referenced within the game. Hecate, sometimes evil, sometimes good. She is both the mother of evil and the mother of life. To understand her influence completely, it is important we look at her roots in ancient legends. Hecate was once a titan. The titans ruled the heavens, the earth, and the sea. They gave mortals wealth, victory, wisdom, and luck. Hecate was known to withhold these blessings if she felt mortals did not deserve them. Eventually, the Olympian gods would defeat the Titans and cast them down. However, Hecate alone was allowed to retain her powers under the rule of Zeus. From then on, Hecate would preside over many realms, not only magic, witchcraft, ghosts, and necromancy, but also crossroads, knowledge of herbs and poisonous plants, the moon and the night. In this early form, she was represented as a single figure in a long robe, holding burning torches. She enjoyed her time in the underworld, where she could come and go as she pleased, and was eventually allowed to stay as long as she liked. Hecate, unlike many other gods and goddesses, enjoyed the company of those who were different, unique even, those shunned out of fear or misunderstanding. She was never considered particularly evil, though she certainly commanded realms that struck fear into the hearts of men. People instead believed that she would often use her magic for good, that she protected young children, shepherds and sailors. One of her most well-known myths, in fact, was that of Persephone, where Hecate helped Persephone's mother, Demeter, to find her daughter in the underworld by guiding her with her flaming torches. It was not until later when her myth reshaped itself to show a darker side, that people began to fear her. As time passed, Hecate was revered less and less, and fear took its place. Her darker aspects were enhanced. The people only made mention of witchcraft, necromancy, and her persistent stay in the Greek underworld. They began naming her Daughter of Tartarus, Daughter of Hell, and her depictions were no longer single-formed. She was now presented as an ever-shifting visage, typically triple-formed, with three bodies, but often simply three heads. 
From her left shoulder sprouted a long-maned horse, while her right shoulder held the face of a furious hound, the middle head that of a serpent or sometimes a lion. Instead of torches, she now held swords in each hand. The Oxford Classical Dictionary reads, Outlandish in her infernal aspects, she is more at home on the fringes than in the centre of Greek polytheism. Intrinsically ambivalent and polymorphous, she straddles conventional boundaries and eludes definition. She is one of the most literal definitions of shades of grey one can find in the Greek pantheon. As the years went on, Hecate was depicted as much less powerful, and instead focused on witchcraft more and more. Her name was even invoked on ancient curse tablets, and temples dedicated to her worship would partake in blood consumption during secret rituals. It was said that the goddess herself would drink blood alongside her followers, though it would generally be animal blood, not human blood. It is important to know that as her character developed in this way, she was still noted as having a protective side. It was simply more destructive. She was known to exact vengeance upon those who caused harm to the people she protected, more so than directly shielding those under her wing. So, now you know who Hecate was in our world. The most obvious link, of course, is Macbeth, as the play is quite literally mentioned in the game. According to this, within the play, the crones in Hecate meet a second time, in a scene described as a cavern, in the middle, a boiling cauldron, very reminiscent of the crones at the Sabbath. However, there are more crossovers we can find, such as her three-headed appearance. On one shoulder, a vicious hound, the other, a long-maned horse. This is reflected well in the game by having a werewolf, and wolves in general, guard her tree, and a horse acting as her vessel once freed. Furthermore, as you free the spirit from her tree, she goes on to destroy the nearby village that serves the crones directly. In doing so, she avenged the children's sacrifice and delivered a blow to the crones' power. But in her madness, she neglected to protect the children still among the villagers. Other villages in the area were never touched. The now enchanted mare simply vanished and was not heard from again. She also does in fact save the children as she promised Geralt she would. As said, the children can later be found in an orphanage in Novigrad, safely playing after seemingly forgetting all the horrors they'd been through. Her supposed fall to madness would also be a direct parallel to our real-world Hecate's fall from grace in the eyes of the world. Starting as a beloved guardian deity, only to see herself become a symbol of fear and purveyor of curses who relished the taste of blood. A timeline with this in mind would look much like this. The crones and the whispering hillock. We'll call her Hecate for now. Initially worked together peacefully. Perhaps Hecate was indeed a druid of Velen in her past life, and perhaps they sought only to help those in times of need. After all, the villager at the feast does mention the following. Ladies of the wood visit you? If they favor us. My father told me they descended once. Passed from fire to fire listening to hopes and grievances. So each year, we wait for them to walk amongst us once more. Haven't done it in a long time, then. So the crones did once, long ago, come down from the mountain to speak to the villagers, listen to the troubles and worries, but they haven't done so in a very long time. A very long time. The man who gives us this information is old himself already, and he speaks of his father witnessing this event. We don't know how old his father was at the time, though. He might have been a child himself. So why haven't they come down since then? Likely, because something changed. From Siri, we get the following information. Avalok told me of beings who commune with the NL Elves. They can be found in every part of our world. In Velen, the crones do this. Apparently, Imlarith came here at Eridin's behest to order the crones to keep their eyes open and ears pricked, in case Avalok were to seek shelter in his Velen hideout. As the crones and Hecate work together, either as sisters or as mother and daughter, something caused a rift between them. That something, I would guess, was the wild hunt. The NL approached them and offered them a deal, power of some kind, but in return, 
they would act as their agents in this world. The crones were eager to accept this deal, to gain influence and power, but Hecate turned the elves down, either because she recognized them for what they were, or because she was unwilling to bow, and with that, she turned down the crones as well. Even though at the time, the crones may well have had good intentions, they may have thought to help their followers further with their newfound strength. After all, Kira does tell us that in better times, the witches of the nearby villages would act as messengers between the villagers and the ladies. There was direct contact, and the witches were allowed to return to their homes afterwards. However, power corrupts, as is well known, and the NL would have welcomed such corruption, given their aims all the more. The ladies of the wood fear Imlareth, fear the NL, so we know for a fact that the elves hold far greater power than them. With their help, they would be able to overthrow Hecate, who was likely the stronger one of the four, in order to seal their deal with Eridin. To explain this sudden change, the crones spun a story to make Hecate look like the truest of all evils. The book, She Who Knows, talks of them only as saviors, who defeated their wicked mother when she spun out of control. Others call them the crones, but you call them the ladies of the wood. Those who name them crones, them's artless fools. The ladies of the wood have watched over this land for ages. In what way? They drive out evil powers. They say a hundred springs ago, they saved Velen from a plague of werewolves ravaging our flocks. Forgive me. I didn't know you came from the ladies of the wood. They help you often? From the time of his cutting, every man is theirs. They be harsh mistresses, but they're fair. Just. Demanding they can be, but then nothing in life comes easy. Who drove off the plaguey heirs? Who gave us seeds to plant? Round the other villages, they be eating the soles of their boots, whereas we, well, we get along well enough. The crones threw Hecate out and took over as the sole power in Velen, slowly losing their connection to the villagers as those to aid, instead seeing them as those to use. They could make demands easily, as famine ravaged the lands around them. Through blood sacrifices, they could grant the villagers magical seeds that would feed their hungry kin, cure all that ailed them, and in so doing, it tied the people to their masters. But, even with the help of the wild hunt, they could not completely kill Hecate, merely bind her spirit to the tree. And as she lay there thrashing in impotent rage, with the years passing her by endlessly, she truly did start slipping away further and further into darkness, until nothing more was left but a husk of her former self, now as ruthless as the crones who caged her. But even a spirit needs sustenance to stay alive, and so she took to calling victims to her in their sleep. Throughout my first fortnight in Velen, I had horrible nightmares. Something was calling me out into the swamps, one night, I decided to enter the dream consciously, render it lucid. I confronted the thing directly. It broke contact at once. Peaceful nights ever since. Those who fell into her trap were devoured, but those who refused ran to the crones for aid. And the crones sent Geralt. Because the ladies, too, were still afraid to face Hecate directly, even in her weakened state, afraid of what she might do without the protection of the NL to aid them. So they sent a witcher to deal with their problem, and if Geralt does his job and kills her, all's well that ends well for the three sisters. But if not, well, Hecate, weak as she is in her newly regenerated body, likely ran off to regain her strength after destroying Down Warren, and one day aims to return and have her revenge. Not that it would be entirely necessary, given Geralt and Ciri would have taken care of that problem already. Although, even that we can't be sure of. Should you find yourself dealing with a bad ending in The Witcher 3, you guide Geralt to the final crone, Weves, who escaped. Before Geralt approaches her, we can hear her talk to the tapestry, to her sisters. Patience, she urges, for they shall yet have his soul. 
The tapestry itself is heavily scarred, the images of the dead crones ripped out entirely. When Geralt eventually confronts her, she comments on the approaching monsters as well. The monsters are angry because Geralt slaughtered their brethren for a fistful of coin. Weavess seems to imply that her sisters are still technically alive, though not in the sense that humans can comprehend. That isn't all that strange, given our earlier comparison to the witches from Macbeth and Hecate, who are all said to exist on the fringes of existence. She also specifically notes taking Geralt's soul, which leads me to think that through the consumption of flesh, the crones don't only devour their lifeblood, but their very souls, their memories, their emotions, everything. Gontro Dim collected souls similarly, though in a different manner. It's not surprising that in the Witcher universe, much like many other tales, souls hold great power. But it is striking that the only creatures we cannot truly describe in detail are the ones known to covet them. Did the dead crone's souls retreat to the same realm as Gaunter did when he was defeated? Is that realm accessible to mere mortals? And if not, are we ever truly safe? Perhaps Weave S meant to use Geralt's soul, his strength, to bring her sisters back. Given enough hair infused with soul energy, she could weave the tapestry anew, and that may well be how they exist in this world at all. The tapestry could be their physical link to this world, and to defeat them fully and truly, one would need to burn it wholly. Perhaps. And although the crones were evil in many ways, they did save the villagers from starvation also, seemed to keep the land healthy, and mostly kept their promises. Hecate herself, I do believe, was a good soul long ago, and I think she can be again. But is it worth the risk? I don't believe we'll ever get complete answers to our questions. But I hope I've gotten as close as possible with my theories, at least. Nothing is certain in our dealings with the crones, save that their aid always comes at a price. A, a boy! Andrus, a boy! Look at him, he's beautiful. I dared not dream I would live to see him take his first breath. A strong son. A blessing, my love. Andrus? His hand? What's that on his hand? I... How strange. A, a birthmark, perhaps? That is no birthmark. Andrus... It couldn't be. They wouldn't have. I, I, I offered them all the golden lands they wished. Tell me you didn't. The, the ladies. The crones. Please, Andrus. I'm sorry. Breen, I'm so sorry. I did not know. I should have listened. <laughs> <laughs>